Thank you, everyone. Well, today's daily word is healing. And the affirmation for today is spiritual understanding expresses as healing for myself and others. Sunday, July 15th. There is no obvious consistency with the healings of Jesus that are described in the four Gospels. Some involve laying on of hands, while other times the healing is achieved at a distance. All Gospels report a variety of healings taking place, yet none explain how Jesus did his work. The Gospel of Luke shares that Jesus speaks to them th about the kingdom of God. Jesus knew that healing could occur with a change in the consciousness. Whatever the physical, mental, and emotional symptoms, faith in new and unlimited possibilities allow a healing to happen by focusing on the kingdom of consciousness to which Jesus calls us. Spiritual understanding can be and will express as healing. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed to be cured is Luke 19, 9, 11. So the word for today is healing and the affirmation together. Spiritual understanding expresses as healing for myself and others. Thank you. Thank you. Now I invite you to visualize our sanctuary as a beautiful heart. And let's see this heart moving in and around and through each one of us. Just filling this room with the love, the caring, and compassion that you have for yourselves and each other. And we see this energy going up to Sunday school with Kayla and the children, knowing they're all blessed. And so in these moments, let our heart be full. Fill it with your wonderful understanding of life, filled with truth, with love, and all the wonderful things that are part of who you are and part of God and expression. And in these moments, if you are in need of prayer or you know of anyone in need of prayer, see them in our heart. And if there's any circumstance in your life, in our world, in need of prayer, See them in our heart as we sing the prayer for protection. Can we just continue in this prayerful mode? We take time for meditation and we join with others in consciousness around the world. I just invite you to center yourself in the one presence and one power, the spirit of joy. For the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And so I breathe into this idea as I quiet myself. I relax and make this my time to commune with righteousness, my God, my good within. I practice that which allows me to rest during this time. I let go of any tension in my body. As I exhale, I let go. For the breath of good moves in me in the quiet.
the breath of joy moves through me. The breath of joy moves through me. I gain confidence as eternal joy calls me to new purpose. I look forward and see a world that works for all. And I breathe into this idea. I picture my joy flowing out from my center to those in my church, my household, to my neighborhood, my community, my island, and the people of the world. For this connection with spirit, I feel so grateful. consciousness back to this room, I affirm, I build on eternal joy and live my life of purpose. And so it is. <laughs> on a cold winter day in January 1930, Myrtle Fillmore wrote to a woman requesting prayer. Be glad for the joys of the past, but do not hold on to them. There are present joys. Joy is an eternal quality. Rejoice evermore. And Myrtle Fillmore wrote thousands of encouraging letters to people around the world. Myrtle, of course, founded Unity with her husband, Charles Fillmore, in Kansas City, Missouri. She edited the children's magazine, We Wisdom, and directed the Silent Unity Prayer Ministry, the prayer ministry that we still talk about and communicate with. Now, Myrtle's early life didn't indicate a leadership role. She had been born on a farm in Ohio. She'd been raised in a strict religious atmosphere. And as a young woman, growing up in the 19th century, there weren't a lot of opportunities. She also experienced ill health. But with her healing came a new understanding of God. That understanding of God transformed her life and the lives of countless others. This morning, we're going to talk more about this concept of joy. And I believe that Myrtle Fillmore got up each morning clear of her purpose. Why did you get up this morning? We'll look at the concepts of joy and how they relate to purpose. We'll explore how enjoying life builds a firm spiritual foundation. So this morning, we examine other people from history who knew their purpose. We'll look at a concept called ikigai, meaning reason for being. And we'll look at what brings us joy. So I have another question for you this morning. Who have I come here to be? Who have you come here to be? Who have I come here to be? So this morning, we can examine our lives in the context of our divine arrival on this planet. I just invite you to affirm with me this morning. I build on eternal joy and live my life of purpose. Together, I build on eternal joy and I live my life of purpose. On a hot summer day in 1863, Frederick Douglass stood with others just outside the White House. It was his first visit 
and he handed his card forward. And President Lincoln invited him in. Douglas had become an important advocate for African Americans. The divided nation came to know him as a public speaker, as a writer, and an activist to abolish slavery. Some listeners doubted his backstory, but recognition came when he published his autobiography of his experiences, his enslavement on a Maryland plantation, the violence, learning to read, his planned escape, and his path to prominence. And though Frederick Douglass could have retreated to private life, he publicly spoke for his nation to live up to its ideals of freedom. So when do you feel free? Often we feel free when we feel at ease, when we're comfortable in a job or a relationship, it comes when we experience our sense of purpose. And one guide to this discovery is this concept called ikigai, an Okinawan process, which allows us to discover our reason for being. And here's the thing. I think all of you have a reason for being. There's a reason that got you up this morning. You may not realize it, but it's somewhere there. And if you want to know more, I just invite you to go online and explore this. There's a whole lot about Ikigai. Now I know that some of you already know your purpose. Some of us have taken a long, winding road. And some others are still uncovering this. The truth is that it exists within each of us. An ikigai is actually a convergence of several elements. It's your mission, it's your vocation, your profession, and your passion all together. Your ikigai is personal to you. It reflects your values, your experiences, and your desires. This morning, we'll look briefly at four of the concepts of Ikigai. What the world needs, what you can get paid for, that's important, right? What you're good at, and what you love, or what brings you joy. So we'll look first briefly at these first three. What the world needs, what you can get paid for, and what you're good at. So what does the world need? Love, I heard that. Peace. Food. Equity. I'm guessing that your list is as long as mine. We can all ask ourselves what would you like to see change in the world? It can be those big ideas like human rights education and protection. It can be loving treatment for those who are fleeing oppression, basic housing and health care and food for everyone. It can be a really long, big list. But something on that list is part of your purpose. Something on that list is part of my purpose. So we can ask ourselves, what can I give to the world? We'll look briefly at what we can get paid for. So your vocation allows you to take care of yourself and your family. My work has taken me to historic sites, to museums, to archives, and then into churches. It could be that what I get paid for, what you get paid for, changes. One thing to remember, financial stat status does not equate joy. So when we talk about what we're good at, this speaks to your profession. It speaks to the skills that you bring to whatever you're doing. Now, when you retire, you might think of some of these aspects in a different way. When you're retired, you might leave out getting paid. Maybe you've already got that figured out and make three lists, your values, what you enjoy, and the things you're good at. 
And when you unite those, you find your ikigai. So Frederick Douglass looked at what he would like to see change in the world. I imagine Frederick Douglass felt anger, but instead of acting out, he chose to advocate for the rights of African Americans. We forget that he also advocated for the right of women to vote. He reminded everyone to find valuable qualities in our fellows, some qualities must be presumed and expected. He set his expectations high. He was often disappointed, but Douglas skillfully communicated his vision of freedom and opportunity for all Americans, and he got paid for it, right? Because he had a speaking circuit. Myrtle, Myrtle Fillmore wanted the world to be a more enlightened place. She expressed herself by encouraging spiritual growth in others. And I think they both found their ikigai, their reason for being. On January 9th, 1978, Harvey Milk and his supporters walked from the Castro to San Francisco's City Hall in celebration. He had just become one of the first openly gay government officials in the United States, a city supervisor. Sharing the freedom of authenticity became his purpose. Interestingly enough, Harvey considered his religion to be classical music. But he did once quote a childhood rabbi. You shouldn't be concerned about what people say to you about how you live your life as long as you feel you're living it right. Many people discounted Milk's resolve. Many people opposed him. He'd grown up in New York City He'd wandered from teaching to the Navy, to the stock exchange, to that tiny camera shop in the Castro. But Harvey Milk excelled at campaigning and conveying the message that everyone has the right to live how they choose. So how do you choose to live? Discovering your own ikigai is said to bring fulfillment, to bring joy, and maybe even to allow you to live longer. So let's look at that fourth element of ikigai, and maybe the most important. What brings you joy? What do you love? What's your passion? Let's think about this concept of joy. Joy is an emotion of great delight, keen pleasure, elation. Often we think of joy as something consistent and cultivated internally. Joy comes when you experience a fountain of spiritual substance, eternal joy. So how is joy different than happiness? Well, sometimes we use the two words synonymously. When we're happy, we feel delighted, we feel pleased or glad. But often we talk about happiness related to things in the world, particular people or places or things or thoughts or events. So happiness can be temporary and affected externally. Joy is something we need. As human beings, we have needs for physical well-being, for food, for connection, for meaning, for honesty, for autonomy. Play, even as adults, joy and humor are among those needs. And the list gives us insight into a world that works for all. It's a world where we all feel at ease. Now think about it, without our basic needs met, we might experience anger or withdrawal. We might act out or even commit self-harm. 
When our basic needs are met, we experience positive feelings. We feel joyful, we feel amused, we laugh when something's funny. We may feel jubilant or even tickled. So maybe you're not sure about where your joy comes from. Sometimes we connect to it when we connect to those things that we love. Maybe ask, what are you curious about? When do you lose all sense of time? So for me, I feel joy in creating cards, in taking photos, and surprise, surprise, doing historical research. I can become so engaged in those details and the creative process that I lose all sense of time. It's as if time just disappeared. So we can figure out what we enjoy, but that might not pay the bills. I know some of you in the room enjoy lying on the beach, probably as much as I do. And we may live in joy and fullness, but not necessarily wealth. Our passion, that something that we love, can be combined with our mission, with our vocation, and our profession. And when those converge, we found our ikigai. So in their book, Ikigai, Hector Garcia and Francesca Morales write about how Okinawans often live long and joyful lives. Okinawa boasts the most centenarians in the world. They're some of the healthiest people on earth. And the authors describe not only the process of Ikigai, but how Okinawans eat fresh food, in moderation. They made activity, maintain activity well into advancing age, and they rise each morning with purpose. Buddhist teachers refer to an inner spring of infinite joy, something may, we may all tap into. The Christian scripture suggests that joy is eternal. And the scriptures remind us that it's one of the fruits of the Spirit. Joy is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Myrtle Fillmore understood that joy is an eternal quality. She found her joy in what she called her discovery, her union of the divine. Douglas found his joy in living a life of freedom. And Harvey Milk found his joy in living an authentic life. Milk took his joy and his purpose and he shared it with the world. He spoke this vision, hope for a better world, hope for a better tomorrow, hope for a place to go if the pressures at home are too great, hope that all will be all right. So this morning, may we all hope for a better world a better tomorrow, a place to get away from the pressure and that all will be all right. May we realize joy in the midst of our lives. So I just invite you to affirm with me again. I build on eternal joy and I live my life of purpose. Together, I build on eternal joy and I live my life of purpose. We may find joy when we take breaks from social media, when we keep a journal, when we practice gratitude. May we experience that well of joy as we open ourselves in meditation and to the wonder in the world. When we enjoy life, we build on a firm spiritual foundation. I hope deep joy for all of you. Namaste.